um, in the year 1970, in the year 1974, um, I I was asked by a lady in our church, a a grandmother, an old older grandmother. Um, sickly and um, her, her life was real hard. And she had a granddaughter that she was helping with and the granddaughter got pregnant. She was, she was away from God. She was living a wild life. And the grandmother, Miss, Mrs. Cleveland, called me and asked if I would go with her to take her daughter to get an abortion. And I honestly, how many know that it was 1973 that abortion was made legal in the United States? Um, without, without any restrictions, basically. And so 1973 was Roe v. Wade, and when the Supreme Court um, voted to, into law uh, that it was legal to get abortions. So, so... A year later or so, a year later or so, I uh, have not, I've never heard of any, I've never known anyone get an abortion. I, I honestly didn't know that much about it. And I didn't even think about the rightness or wrongness of it. I was t trying to help Mrs. Cleveland and go, went with her from Nacogdoches in our church. And Mr. Roman, I probably am still gonna need you for that one verse, sorry. Um, so, um, in Nacogdoches to Houston's about 150 miles. So I went with Mrs. Cleveland and this granddaughter, maybe about 14 years old or 15. And I, it was strange, it was a strange experience uh, having never experienced it before, uh, I didn't know what to say to the girl. I'm not sure if I was even born again yet at that point. But I went down there and it was just like, um, it was really sad. It was really, um, I felt real sorry for the girl. It seemed like she was going, having a struggle. And I don't think the grandma, I don't think we understood at that time how, um, pervasive that abortion would become. It was like, oh, this was an unusual situation and the grandma didn't know better. And so uh, anyway, uh, this, this weekend being Mother's Day is also right after this past week when, or was it the week before, that somebody leaked a, uh, the document about the, the, that the over that the Supreme Supreme Court was going to overturn Roe v. Wade, and um, and then abortions would be restricted in in certain states. It would be up to the states. And well, as you can tell, there's protests going on everywhere. The uh, Women mainly, but men probably also, and all ages of people are protesting this assault that is what they say on the rights of women. And that it took forever for women to get the, right, the rights over their own body. And then for in 2022, for the Supreme Court to reverse Roe v. Wade, uh, I mean, they're getting really angry. Um, they're having protests in churches. They're, they're going to disturb church services today. I didn't know if there would be any here. But um, we know that there is the pro-life people and the pro-choice board. Well, there's pro-life, pro-choice, and pro-abortion. And um, so... So we know that there's the, that the majority in the United States believe 
in pro-choice and uh, a lesser percentage believe pro-life. And I'm, I'm just going to show you something here before I go to my scripture. Um, and, I, and I'll have only one verse, but Romans faithfully up there waiting for me. But um, I want us to go first of all to, uh, to see where do we stand? Where does the church stand on all of this? And so I want to go to Revelation chapter 21. Uh, just, just one verse there. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 8. And it's just, it's just one of the many, 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 many lists in the Bible of, of who... Um, who will be going to hell? And there's many lists. Not, none of them must be comprehensive because they don't list all the Ten Commandments. But this verse just says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So, uh, over and over and over and over, we see that, that uh, the way that a person gets, a girl gets pregnant, a woman, is uh, if she's unmarried, then that uh, pregnancy, that, that relationship is sinful, according to the Bible. It's called sexual immorality. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple statistics, and then I'm going to... Uh, the first thing is I want, okay, so on the front row here we have four people sitting. And I want you to see a person that should be there but is not. What I'm trying to say is for every four people in the United States who are alive, there's one that has died because of abortion. So, not including all the other ways of death. But for every four people, there's one person that's not there in the United States because of abortion. Uh, close, to 63, 000, close to 63 million babies have been aborted since 1973 when Roe v. Wade was made into law. So, what, what we re find out in, in, um, on Google, statistics, 50% of people who call themselves Christians do not consider sex outside of marriage sinful. 50% of people who call themselves Christians do not consider sex out sexual relations outside of marriage sinful. Sinful. Twenty-two percent of all pregnancies end in abortion. Twenty-two percent. Now, if we understand that that um, there are all kinds of birth control, there are pills that cause abortions. And so for 22% of babies to die by abortion, there are many that die by, by the pill or by other ways. So I, I, can't, I can't give a whole ton of, of, of statistics, but I, I want us to look at what's happening and what God says about it. So, so God says that sexual sin will send us to hell. Now, when you when you add an abortion to that, that is considered murder.
and that also in God's book is <coughs> sin, an abortion, uh, killing a person, uh, getting an abortion, hating someone is murder in God's book. So we're just isolating two, two areas right here. And, and most, 50% of people who call themselves Christians do not believe that it's sin to have a relationship with someone that you're not married to. And yet God says that these people will be in the lake of fire. And a whole bunch of people who call themselves Christians do not say agree that abortion is murder. I want, I want to explain to you today that, that when a baby is conceived, when a baby is conceived, that child has the DNA, all the DNA they're going to need for their whole life. They are a complete human being, yet in embryonic form. In God's eyes, this fetus is a person. And that person has a living soul. So when the sperm and the egg come together and a fetus, a child is conceived, this child now has a living soul. And so when, when people take the life of these children, uh, of course a lot of them are already in sin. But we just have to know what God says about life. That life has His image. That life, human beings have living souls. Now, now, babies, when they're aborted, uh, would immediately go to, to be with the Lord. And I'm saying, these babies are bang, 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 bang. Not one of them will go to hell. But that does not excuse the people that commit the sin. I, I want us to go to a verse... And I'll get to that one next. Uh, I want us to go to a verse in Matthew. And uh, I think it's Matthew 18. And, and I know it's... Uh, okay. Now, Matthew 18... Verse 7 says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. The laws that we make, the example that is set by people in high places, I'm going to just say America right now. Uh, by the way, there's 3,000 abortions a day in America on average. 3,000 a day. But it says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come. In a sinful world, you can expect people to sin. But woe to the person through whom they come. So it doesn't matter what kind of sin is being committed at, at this point. But everybody that has a part in it, cur the curse is spoken. Jesus says, woe to the person through whom the sin comes. So it's not just the person getting pregnant or the guy getting a girl pregnant. It's all of the influences and it's all of the laws and it's all of the uh, pull and power of the world. It doesn't exonerate the person that is caught in the sin. But the sin goes farther than that individual person. And so he pronounces a condemnation on the world. How many know the world is going to be totally condemned in the end? 
How many understand that the whole earth is going to burn up? Right. Yes. And everything on the earth, and in God's judgment that's coming, all sinners will be caught in that. And they will be, uh, they will, all manner of uh, uh, catastrophes are going to happen. But the ultimate catastrophe is they'll go to hell. But look at verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. And we, we know that this is He's, he's using this to explain how serious it is. How many can say amen? amen? To whatever God says, you can take that to the bank. Whatever God says is going to be judged, and whatever is going to be condemned, how many know that you can count on that to be true 100%? Amen. Raise your hand. If God says it, how many believe yes. that it's got to be 100%? I thank God for all these hands because I'm, I'm telling you there's some fear of God in here. Yes. That you can hear people say all this stuff, but when it comes right down to it, if God's not saying that, right, right. we can't agree with it. Amen. No matter who in Congress, no matter if it's the President, no matter who it is, right. no matter if preachers from the pulpit are saying right. it's okay, it doesn't matter. Right. We have the law of God. Yes. And this law supersedes every other law. That's right. And this constitution supersedes every other constitution. That's right. So thank God there's something solid under our feet. Amen. There's something solid supporting us. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And his word is truth. Amen. Now, can you give me that? He's been faithful to do this. Amen. Thank you, Roman. You can leave it up. Jesus said, I ask you which is right, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. I was thinking of this verse yesterday, and I even Googled, and I couldn't find it in any commentary, and then I'm, I'm reading in the Word and I find it. Amen. So he's, it actually says in there, I ask you, which is lawful? Right. Which is lawful on the Sabbath? Right. <laughs> because that was an argument. But to make you see it clearer, I, he said, I ask you, which is right? Yes. To do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Right. So he puts saving life in the category of doing good. Yes. And destroying life in the category of doing evil. That's right. What I'm referring to here is not just abortion. I want you to see, I want us to understand that anything that's done to harm a person, whether physically, or spiritually, it's a no-no with God. To save life is to do right by people. Yes. And also to save their souls. Amen. To do right by people on this earth, our neighbor, our family, everyone but also to save their soul. We can say that in the church. They're not going to say that in Congress. Right. But I'm going to shout it in this church. It is right to save people from hell. Amen. It is right Amen. to yes. save people from destruction. Yes. yes. That's pretty quiet. Amen. It is right. Amen. It Amen. is Amen. right. Amen. To do good. Amen. It, is, it right. is right to help people that don't know what's right and wrong. Yes. It's right 
to do everything we can to save everyone we can from condemnation. That's right. And to enable them to have life everlasting. That's right. Now I want us to go to Luke and Luke 1 and I want us to my my greatest uh, mother idol <laughs> I'm going to say mother not idol, mother hero yes. is Mary the mother of Jesus. Now I want to I want to say to you <clears throat> That I am pro life. Amen. I am pro life oh, Mark. Amen. in every realm. Yes. Every realm. Right, right. Because life is from God. And yes. so I am pro life. Hallelujah. Yes. I want life to be saved at every level, in every situation. Amen. Amen. And I want more than just to save bodies, I want to save souls. Amen, yes. yes. Amen. And so I want to tell you about this lady, a girl, 15 or so, 15 or 16 years old, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And this girl named Mary was from a town in Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we want to see that she is looked down on. Everybody in Galilee, in, in the Jewish culture and religion, they are looked down on. She has everything against her. They are poor. They have the Roman uh, tax collectors and people that they, they have the wicked Jews at their throats because they are a remnant. They are people that believe the Messiah is coming. And they not only believe, they're a, they're a small group of believing Jews. And they believe the Messiah is coming. And Mary goes so far as to pray to be the mother of the Messiah. Now, I know I have a brother over here who will question me, Mr. Anthony, <laughs> because it doesn't directly say this. Yes. But I've, about three years ago, I felt like God was speaking. He quizzed me about it. I felt like God was revealing this clearly to me. And as I was praying about it yesterday, I felt like he made it clear that this, this young girl, six, maybe 15, 16, maybe 17, she, look at, look at chapter 1, verse 47. This girl had already come to faith in Jesus Christ. Even before he came, she knew that the Messiah was the hope of salvation to the Jews and the world. But she just said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's been mindful of my humble state, the humble state of his servant, his child. And I said her state was humble. It was lowly. She had nothing going for her in the natural but she had faith in the coming Messiah. And she was living a holy life. Look at verse 26. The angel came to Nazareth. And like I said, uneducated people, very poor. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. She was pledged to be married, but she had kept herself from sin. Uh, they were not living together. And, and he was a descendant of David, which the Messiah was going to come through as a descendant of David. 
And it says her name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. So we could say, because the Lord was with her, she was highly favored. God had to have a way to bring his Messiah, his son, into the world. Do you see? There probably were very, very, very few girls that could have been available, could have been acceptable to be the mother of the Messiah. And he said, greetings, you who are highly favored. And Mary was troubled, greatly troubled. I mean, to, to encounter an angel would put sh shake you to your, how many think they might just fall over half dead? Yeah. <laughs> she was scared and wondered what kind of greeting. And, but the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor. And we just read, I just read over in chapter 1 yesterday, and look at chapter 1, verse 12. Zechariah had an angel appear to him, and, and he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. So it's showing us that there's very great similarities in this. But I, my point is I'm trying to get is Mary wanted to be the virgin spoken about in Isaiah that would be with child. And she couldn't understand or grasp how a, a, a virgin could be with a child. But he said, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will be with child and give him birth and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, I want us to remember the verse that John spoke. He said, when Jesus appeared, he called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So she has some concept that he will take away the sin of the whole world. And it, it says he will be, how many know somebody has to be pretty great if they're going to take away sin? Oh, yes. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Amen. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will never end. So he's un she's understanding the Messiah is going to be God in the flesh. <clears throat> Try to wrap your mind around that. How she would feel when she understood it more now. That she's asking to bear God in the flesh. Wow. Wow. And so, so down below, well, the... She says, how can this happen? And the angel, verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. How in the world can a miracle happen? Through God himself, right? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She also has a child miraculously, but not as miraculous. And she was, she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Amen. God was going to find a virgin. God was going to find not just someone who hadn't been with a man, but someone who was a believer in him and was living for him. So what, what I want you to see, this is a prayer. She said, my soul, verse 
46, she said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I just read it, but I'm reading. For he's been mindful. Amen. He didn't think I was too low down no, no. In, in this totem pole of life. He was mindful yes. of my state. And that didn't keep him from choosing me. And she said, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Yes. His mercy extends to those who fear him. Amen. Yes. From generation to generation. He has performed performed mighty deeds by raising up a lowly Jew. He's performed a mighty deed with his arm. And all the people that are in the in group, the mighty people, the wicked people, he's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their throne, but has lifted up the humble. All these Jewish rulers, Jewish leaders, had thrones, and they were coming to an end. They were going to be destroyed. But he's filled the hungry with good things, and has sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. My point today is that Mary wanted more than to bear this Messiah, which was an honor in itself. That is an honor. There's only one in the whole world. One woman could be the mother. And Mary was chosen. And I told you the reasons why she was chosen. But she wanted way more than to bear the Messiah in her body. More than to give birth to him. Even more than to raise him up. How many know how many years he was in the home with Mary? How many years was Jesus in the home with Mary? Thirty years. At twelve years old, they went to Jerusalem. And he went in a temple. And he said, I had to be about, he had to be about his father's business. But it was 18 more years before he left that home. Wow. And while he was there, Mary had between six and eight more children. At age 14, I think, it, I read some history, I'm not sure. But the father died. Joseph died. And Mary had the, all the work. Uh, the, but I, it seemed like Jesus took up the work to help her. And to help with these younger ones. We know there was at least four brothers, at least two sisters. Some say there were five brothers and three sisters. But the point is that all the things that she did to help bring this God-man into this world and to raise him up was for the purpose of verse, chapter 1, verse 48, when she said, from now on all generations will call be blessed. Why 
would all generations, yes, she's bearing the God man. She's nurturing, raising up God in the flesh. And uh, all the ministry that Jesus was born without sin, but he had to be trained up. He was a human that had the Holy Spirit, but not in the fullness yet. He's not filled with the Spirit at birth. He's filled with the Spirit at his baptism. But what she wanted, she wanted to have a part in the salvation of the world. Amen. She wanted to have a part. She wanted to play a part in the salvation of every person. <clears throat> From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Because God blessed her that the fruit of her womb, being Jesus, was the Savior of the world. And by the part that she played, she had responsibility to save the world. How many can understand a little bit more about what pro-life is? I want you to know that Mary was pro-life. Mary gave her life for the salvation of the world. What I wish people could find is that if they could find Christ, first they would find what their heart's always been wanting, what they've always been hungering for. And they were looking for it in this person or this person or this or this. But what they find in Christ is so much better than all the other things of the world combined. Jesus does more for us than I even have words to describe. I cannot describe to you today what Jesus can do for you. It is off the charts. It's unimaginable what he has in store for people that will come to him. Mary's an example of what God has in store for those who put their faith in Him. I don't go out fighting abortion. I rarely make a statement about it. I'm fighting for life in every realm. I'm fighting for life. I'm, I want you to say a word. It's, the word is Fulfillment. Fulfillment. I'm fighting for humans to be fulfilled Amen. like they never imagined Amen. before. It's because they don't know Christ and they don't have his power over sin that they're caught in every trap of the devil. Caught in every trap of the devil is God's responsibility on parents to lead their child, children, raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not let them fall into immorality. It's not 100% sure that you can keep your child but it's so certain that God puts that authority on parents to keep them from all sin by coming to Christ early in their life. 
and helping them find the foundation for their life that they'll never find anywhere else. So it falls back on parents. And probably a lot of parents didn't have parents that helped them. Let me tell you today, mothers, and let me tell you today, parents, we are responsible for our children to bring them to Christ and to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and help them find fulfillment in Christ. Everything their heart is hungry for is found in Christ. That's right. Mary's heart was so fulfilled. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. My Savior. For he's been humble, mindful of the humble state. And now, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He wants to do great things for every person. Every single person. And not till you come to Christ can you know. You know, we had we had something happen Friday night. I want Eli to come over here and I want I want Would you forgive me? I'm 75 years old. I just want you to stand here a minute, Monter. And I want Lanisa and I want Samuel. I'm trying to think who was at the altar on Friday night. Thomas. And Thomas, okay. And so, man, God blessed us so much. And I prayed with Montre yes. to come to Christ. He said it was the first time in his life he had come to Christ. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Samuel prayed that he would put himself last, weeping at the altar, that he would be last. Amen. Amen. Eli had a breakthrough on Friday night. Amen. God did something mighty in Eli. Amen. Lanisa made her a, a new commitment to this whole ministry. And there was others that aren't here today. Tomas had come to the Lord a while back. I just want to shake your hand again. Bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless you guys. Mother's Day yeah. to think 
what God calls us to. The whole world is telling your children, oh, there's everything wrong. You are telling them the truth. And you are praying for them night and day. If they haven't come to Christ, they'll come to Him. Amen. If they veered away, if they strayed away, you're crying out in your house yes. for them to come back to Christ. Yes. I, I can't tell, tell you here how dangerous it is to have the blood of other people on our hands. That's right. That's right. In every realm of this world, people have the blood of their children, other family members, neighbors. They haven't done right get their children to Christ, to raise them up. They haven't done right. If we're not doing good, we're doing evil. Please help me. That's right. I ask you which is right, That's to right. do good or to do evil. Good. If we haven't done good, we've done evil. Please. That's right. That's right. If we haven't saved life, we've destroyed it. That's right. That's right. And I'm telling you, we won't get by. We will not get by. But we can come back to Christ. Amen. Or we can start again. Amen. Or whatever. And I'm That's telling right. you, my God has mercy. Yes, he does. My God yes, he has does. mercy. No matter how many abortions yes. Yes. there have yes. been. Right. I'm telling you, if there's... That's right. Whatever has been done. Right. That God calls sin. There's a whole lot of stuff. God... Forgives. Amen. But he does not forgive without repentance. That's right. He does not forgive yes. unless your forgiveness, your repentance is real. That's right. Unless you say, I'm leaving that life. Yes. I'm going to have no more of that life. Right, right. I'm coming to Christ. I'm renouncing all the things I've done. Right. I'm, I'm renouncing all the things I've agreed with. All the ways that my kids have been hurt. Right. I'm renouncing everything that I've believed and everything I've done. And I come to him, the Bible says, he will freely yes. forgive. Yes, yes, yes. And he yes. will get you on yes. the right road. And you can save your kids and save your grandkids way more. Yes. You can give your life for pro life. Yes. Generations will call you blessed. If Jesus doesn't come soon, and there's still generations left, generations will call you blessed. Amen. Because you sowed all these seeds for righteousness That's in right. your children, in your grandchildren. And you got, became a part of a church. And you labored in the church. To bring people to Christ. You sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He blessed you with the things you needed. Because you didn't go after all the things you needed. You went after God. You went after his kingdom. And all these things are added. That means, do you think... That the God that created this world cannot take <coughs> care of your needs if you're serving Him. Do you think God who created this world can help you support yourself without having to miss going to the house of the Lord? <coughs> How do you know a God that is bigger and greater than our little imagination. He can do all things. If I seek him first and put him first. I'm sorry. If we're doing it our way. God is not going to bless him. And people can talk blessings. But who wants talk? Oh look at you. Oh look at you. Oh look what you're doing. I don't want talk. I want action. Amen. Really? I want action. I want fruit. 
Yes. I want people to see my kids serving God. Amen. Yes. I want people yes. to see yes. my grandkids yes. serving God. Yes. I want people to see my neighbors serving yes. God because yes. of me. Yes. Yes. All this community serving yes. God yes. partly because of me. Yes. That's what I want to see. Amen. I want to tell you about Mary. Mary lived in Nazareth. Mary raised these six to eight kids after Jesus. I don't know. I know Joseph had been a carpenter. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know how. I guess Jesus was a carpenter. And so, but when Jesus left to come, uh, to his public ministry at 30 years old, his brothers did not believe in him. I don't know about his sisters. But he came and ministered for three years. Yes. And Mary was living in Nazareth. But at the end of Jesus' life, Mary, there, toward the time of the crucifixion, came to Jerusalem and saw Jesus being crucified. And it had been prophesied that a sword would pierce, pierce her soul. Her personal attachment as a mother, her personal love for Jesus, to see him mutilated, a sword was piercing her heart. She was with the ladies as he was crucified. They stood there, they watched, they stayed. Jesus turned to John. He's on the cross. And he turns to John and says, this is your mother. And to his mother, he said, this now is your son. And I, I didn't understand that. But what I found out was that she now had to live in Jerusalem. And all of her family lived up in Nazareth. And I didn't know why she had to now live in Jerusalem. And it was because, and I'm going to have you turn with me to Acts 1. Because God wanted her now ministering in the early church. And so the 12, 11 disciples and these other people, verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So between his crucifixion, Jesus' crucifixion, and this point, all of his brothers became believers. And Mary was right in the middle of what God was doing to save all these thousands of people. She was there on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on her and all the 119 people. And what, chapter 2 is this absolute miracle. Jesus is now on the throne of heaven. And the Holy Spirit is poured out so that every single person can be filled, every believer Amen. can be filled with the Holy Spirit. They will now have 
They believed in Jesus. They followed him. But now they'll have the supernatural <coughs> power to live for him and to do his work. It may not be exciting to you. This is so exciting to me. This Mary was a part of saving the world from hell. From a young girl praying that she could be the mother of the Messiah. Not for that kind of thing. Oh, there she is, the mother of Jesus, the mother. So that she could have a part in the salvation of the world. And her son James became the pastor of the Jerusalem church. Her family, her kids were raised up to take the gospel farther. I want you to see, I want you to see that being pro-life is the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. And I'm not making it specific about abortion. I'm making it be about everything Amen. that has to do with Jesus. Can you raise your hand if you agree? Amen. Yes. Everything yes. that has to do with Jesus to save people, rescue people from people that are too strong for them, people that have too much power, and lead other people to do evil. Mary was all about life. Mary was all about saving life. Yes. A lot of people are about destroying life. And let me tell you, if you're not about saving life, where you find yourself right now is to destroy life. Because you can't help but destroy life if Christ is not your Lord and your King. You cannot help but destroy life. So, Lord Jesus, I thank you. Yes, God. I thank you. On this weekend, when people are fighting for their rights to kill innocent babies that have no voice, no right. They were, cre they were brought into this world with endless abilities. God, they, any one of them can change the world. And we thank you that they are, they are with you. We thank you that they are with you. All 63 million. 125 million are killed every day in the world. 125 million Babies are aborted. But for all the babies aborted, there are so many acts of sexual sin that it would boggle our mind if we knew that nine out of every ten people were involved in sexual sin in this world. So people are destroying. But who will save? That's right. Who will save? Who will do good and save life? I want you to come and kneel. Who says, I will do good? Pastor, whatever it takes, I will do good and save life. I will make certain that my life is about saving life. My life is about Saving bodies and saving souls. Helping people get out of sin. Because sin leads to destruction. But you came to set every captive free. You came to set every captive. To release every prisoner.
prisoner, slave to sin. God, venereal disease is off the charts. All kinds of disease from the sexual immorality. But somebody here is going to say, Mary is a hero. Because Jesus is a hero. And she came into this world for such a mighty purpose. Such a mighty purpose. A young girl. A young girl. 15 or 16 or 17. Such desire for righteousness. Such a desire to help people. 